Yes, good afternoon and welcome to the virtual AHA webinar, the role of higher ed in AP history courses and exams. My name is Julia Brookins. I'm a staff person with the AHA. My title is Special Projects Coordinator. So I've been involved in a number of initiatives that'll be referenced today, but not centrally or closely uh, working with the college board. So I'm excited to hear what we're gonna talk about today, to see the discussion. Uh, my role will be sort of moderator, but I'm gonna try to have a fairly light touch. Um, I'll go over some housekeeping things. And then at the end, I'll be facilitating the question and answer period. Um, so welcome, the webinar is being recorded and the AHA has a code of conduct, which you should have received a link to. And uh, we are going to have presentations today. The panelists will introduce themselves and do their presentations at the end. Uh, if you have questions, you can put them into the Q&A at any point during the webinar. And then towards the end, we'll have about half an hour to go through questions and answers. And um, we look forward, as I said, if you already have a question, you can put it in there or you can wait until uh, well into the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Again, uh, my name is Julia Brookins. I'm with the AHA and it is my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite people that I get to work with regularly, which is terrific, uh, Daniel McInerney, who is now emeritus at Utah State University. So take it away, Dan. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, again, my name is Dan McInerney. I'm a professor of history at Utah State University. We're in Logan, Utah. It's about 90 miles north of Salt Lake City. I, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and especially uh, to more than half of you, uh, when I looked at the pre-registration list, more than half of you who teach on two-year and four-year campuses. I, I realize that the topic of our webinar uh, may seem a bit unfamiliar to you. It's tough enough trying to keep track of the changes on our own campuses over the past 10 months, let alone trying to track the world of AP courses and exams in secondary schools. But stick with us. I have no doubt that the discussion is one you're well acquainted with. It's all about questions of teaching and learning the kinds of issues that the AHA has focused on for well over 15 years across a range of projects. If, if you've been following our national history conversations over that time, you know we've been tackling some basic and tough questions uh, about our classes, especially at the introductory level. What are we trying to accomplish in our classes? Uh, it seems like a simple enough question that we can all understand, but boy, is that tough to answer. But what are our core goals? Not just individually, the goals we share with our colleagues, the goals that fit into a curriculum that our institution has designed. How do we best organize? How do we best present the content of our classes, the context of questions we pose? The whole issue of historical thinking and our understanding of, of effective pedagogical practices. This is the work that our colleagues in the scholarship of teaching and learning have emphasized all throughout the 21st century. In addition, what do we want our students to know, to understand, to be able to do? It's the work that those of us in the AHA Tuning Project have stressed since 2012. How clearly do we communicate these goals to students, to parents, to employers, to our administrators, and also for those of us in public institutions, to our legislators? It's the work of accountability we've all learned is so important for our work in history. How do we know we're accomplishing our goals? Uh, this is the work of assessment that well, many of us have been dragged into that question, kicking and screaming, but it's, it's a very important one that we have to answer as well. More recently, how familiar are we with the students entering our classes, their backgrounds, their educational training, 
their goals, the assets that they bring into our courses, not just the deficits. And what happens next for our students after they complete our classes? Not just completing another history course, will they complete a post-secondary degree? Or do our gateway courses in particular too often serve, serve as roadblocks, especially for first-generation students from racially, ethnically, economically underserved communities. This is the work of the AHA's new History Gateways Project. The questions we ask ourselves keep expanding. And we're not stacking up all kinds of disconnected projects we're recognizing how our core questions continually converge with pressing academic and social issues. What began for us as an outcomes-based conversation in the AHA has broadened out to emphasize as well an equity-based set of questions concerning history education. And we have a growing number of partners in these discussions one of the most important being the College Board. Our colleagues at the College Board have worked over the past decade thoughtfully re-envisioning AP history courses and exams, drawing on the discipline core that we've defined within the AHA and focusing their efforts on both outcomes and equity helping increasingly diverse secondary school students become better prepared for coursework leading to an associate's and perhaps a bachelor's degree. Now, for a clearer understanding of the changes that have come to AP over this past 10 years, let me turn things over to my colleague at Utah State, Norm Jones, who's worked so closely with the AP on these changes. Norm? Thanks, Dan. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. You didn't ridicule me or make fun of me. Or <laughs> Dan and I have been working together on, on tuning projects and other things for a very long time, uh, which is kind of odd to see us both here. We, we both tried to retire and we, it hasn't worked at all. Um, anyway, I'm Norm Jones. I'm Emeritus Professor of History of Utah State, and uh, I've been in, involved in curriculum reform ever since I started teaching what in the good old days is called Western Civ. Um, but and, and this, this has led me into some very interesting paths. Um, one of them was that Dan and I created or led the first tuning of a history department in the United States and became heavily involved in tuning both in the AHA and nationally. And another byway that it led me into was work with the AP. And I eventually became the chair of the AP Higher Education Advisory Committee. So what I thought I might do for a minute or two here is to take the lid off of the AP we, we, and show you kind of what happens inside. <laughs> because um, most of us have a, a, a sense of the AP that is pretty outdated unless we're very young. You know, if there's anybody in the audience who took the AP test within the last you know, five or eight years, you might understand what AP looks like. Those of you who took the AP earlier than that, it just isn't true anymore. So it, they're not basing the AP American on the Palmer textbook anymore. Don't worry about that. Um, so the question is, how did they come to the decision that the AP history courses had to be rebuilt? And how do they go about uh, rebuilding these things. So one of the places that you start always, that they always start, is with the faculty, with what they're hearing from campuses, because there we have AP colleagues who are spending a lot of time on campuses all across the United States, campuses of all kinds. They're hearing from the AP teachers on the one side, they're hearing from the faculty teaching the same courses on the other, and they're bringing this information back to the table. And one of the places that that information then gets aired is with the AP Higher Education Advisory Committee. This committee is a very interesting animal. Um, it's one of those kinds of committees that you love to be on because you're constantly going, 
wow, they're so different than we are. <laughs> uh, it's a committee made up of academics. Of course, we have all the AP subjects, um, not all represented in the committee, but of course you have academics from the various subjects. You have chief readers uh, who are the people that oversee the, the scoring. Uh, you have admissions officers. And so when I came on the board, it was chaired by the uh, head of admissions from MIT. I can guarantee that admissions at MIT presents different problems than admissions at Utah State. It was really interesting to hear what his world looked like. But the point of the board is that you have admissions people, you have people who are actually teaching the subjects, you have people who are like I became kind of neither fish nor fowl department head and vice provost in charge of general education that works on articulating these problems or these courses, these problem courses. Um, but we all work together and the people come in from the, the AP people come in from the field and say, this is what we're hearing. This is what maybe we would like to do. This is what our research shows. Because one of the things that the College Board has is superb institutional research. They have so much knowledge about what the students are doing with these courses. So that I think anybody who wants to have a conversation about AP should first ask what research is out there rather than assuming that somehow your experience or the, the experience of your children or your nephew is what it is all about. Um, but they bring their field information together with their research to the AP Higher Education Advisory Committee known as APIAC. So it's APIAC from now on. They bring it to APIAC and they say, what do you guys think? And they say, and we've got a problem. They say things like, well, we rolled out the new American history test and the world is just going nuts because there are all sorts of people out there who object to this. The, the, the people who wrote the AP history for dummies, the people that, uh, that think that we're not supporting true patriotism enough and this is where we are, this is what we're hearing. How do we respond to this? What do you need? Do you need a different approach to the explanation of what AP is doing? Do you need a different approach to the way in which you talk about articulation of AP courses? Are there courses we need to add? That's always one of the more interesting discussions is this, well, is there something that the academy is now doing that they didn't do when we, when we set up our courses? Uh, how do you keep moving with the times? The academic disciplines don't stand still. And so moving with the times is very important. So all of these things are on the table, as is the discussion of diversity and equity. I've been most impressed with the, the, the ideal of reaching out, making AP available to, to populations that AP has not been available for traditionally. Uh, I think one of the things that, that is great is that, and probably deeply misunderstood, is that the average AP student is no longer in a prep school in New England. You know, this is... That's a very old model. And so we're, we're getting more and more diversity. And one of the conversations that often happens is, what is the difference between AP and dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment? Well, and I think one of the things that this, this APIAC has really helped with is that they understand, and I hope we're explaining whenever we're given the opportunity, the difference is that the AP has been built by higher education faculty, both in terms of the content and the tests, and that it's a nationally normed test. And I know many of you probably teach in concurrent enrollment, and this is not, not to say concurrent enrollment is not a good experience for many stu students, but it is to say that AP is a nationally normed history test. Um, it's been built by faculty from across the nation, and we have a very good idea of what the entire country's curriculum looks like. And the faculty who are building these courses are in that conversation constantly. So, and then when you examine the students, they're asking those same questions, the questions that align with Tooney. If this is what a history course should look like, how do we prove it on a national scale? So that if you have a student with AP credit, you know that, that they have responded to this normed standard. 
Um, so it's very important. But the, the whole process then of building these things, the Appy Act says, yeah, go and do this. We think that's a great idea. And then they turn to people uh, like Michelle Cool, who's going to speak next and say, okay, how do we do this? So Michelle? You're, you're muted, Michelle. All right, can you hear me now? Oh, thank you, Norm. That was a, a really helpful overview, uh, demystifying the process of AP evolution. I'm going to start sharing slides now. We'll see if those come up. And I'm happy to be here um, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, part of the University of Wisconsin system. And we actually have Lake Winnebago here. It's actually a lake, not just a camper. I found out when I came here. And I'm happy to talk about continuity and change in the AP history exams. Next slide. I'm going to touch on three points. Uh, first is the classic exam that some of you uh, may have taken that Norm was alluding to back in the day. Second, I'll look at the intentional years-long redesign of the exam. And third, I'll look at the reactionary weeks-long pivot in 2020. Next slide. This is an example of a classic AP multiple choice exam question. You can see it's asking for a specific fact. The test succeeded in identifying students who had mastered a great deal of content. But high school teachers and college professors expressed interest in updating the test to reflect skills. Uh, there was also kind of a content creep over the years, right? As each test was given, um, conscientious high school teachers would look over the test and make sure to include in their curriculum anything that they didn't have. And once you do that for 20 years, you have a curriculum bursting with content. So that many teachers were finding uh, across the subjects, not just in the histories, that they didn't have time for more deep dives, you know, like doing a research project or field trips or in biology, you know, doing more labs. And there was this more like sort of march to content. So um, working over the course of several years, College Board and higher ed professionals developed a set of um, historical thinking skills and reasoning processes to think about what are where are we trying to go? What, what are the skills that we want students to have? Next slide. After years of rich debate amongst multiple professionals, this is the result. So you can see the, the different skills here. And you can see that they start at the emerging end and escalate to a higher order. As a, as a teacher myself, I have found them immensely helpful in giving me language and um, guidelines to scaffold my lesson plans for this semester, especially with introductory students. I've also worked with a summer bridge program for incoming students um, from historically disadvantaged backgrounds who are challenged to succeed in college in the first semester. And this has also been helpful in scaffolding lesson plans for those summer bridge students. And instead of assigning that first essay to freshmen and getting a dreadful mess, I start with smaller bites. Um, if you think about writing an essay like a full basketball game, I'm originally from North Carolina, so my examples tend to go to basketball. Um, earlier skills are more like shooting drills. So you could give a student, instead of writing an essay, here's a primary source. Can you identify the author's point of view? Can you think about the purpose? Could you connect it to a different uh, um, compare it to a different primary source. Just this week, um, I teach a pirate history class, and just this week in my pirate history class, we watched the classic Errol Flynn movie, Captain Blood from 1935. And students noticed that um, there was something kind of odd in the movie. It was set in the 18th century Caribbean, which was strangely devoid of African slaves. And so I was able to just pick up on that discussion point and say, okay, we've been working on the skill of contextualization. Can, can we brainstorm contextualization in the 1930s? What's going on that might help us place this movie in a larger perspective? And so we had a language and it's sort of a common um, way to talk about how, how do we make sense of this historical artifact, this movie um, from 1935. So that's just an example of, of how I have found this helpful to use in my own classroom. 
Um, skills five and six, you can see, are particularly geared toward that, that higher order of essay writing. And skill five is, is packed with fun. It has a lot of what we call reasoning processes embedded within skill five. Next slide. Here are the reasoning processes that were, were packed in that skill, and they include comparison, causation, and continuity and change over time. This is also really helpful language to teach students how to craft an argument. If you've ever had a student who says, or emails, or chats you, or Canvas messages, or the many, many ways students can get to you <laughs> nowadays, um, it says, I just don't know what you want. How do I, I don't know how to make an argument. I don't know what you want for this paper you can actually give them these kind of ways to think about how to craft an argument. Are you, are you trying to make a comparison? Are you looking at what caused an event, particularly wars or large sorts of, you know, conflagrations like that? Um, or are we looking at continuity and change over time and, and the extent of continuity and change over time? I draw on these reasoning processes when I'm writing test essay questions for my own classes and I embed them in writing assignments. So when I give them a paper assignment, I, I can include some of these and some of this language to say th these are examples of how you could move forward. Um, and that way you can try to avoid just getting a descriptive slog of this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. You can actually prompt them to say, tr try and go for one of these reasoning processes. Um, I used to write the term on papers a great deal, descriptive rather than analytical. Right. If you've ever gotten a paper that just described things and didn't really analyze. Um, now I have a better way to give feedback for students, particularly on drafts, about how to uh, move past the descriptive and move to the higher order of an analytical paper. So these reasoning processes are a resource for teachers. Um, and they're also the guideline for the way uh, we develop AP exam questions. Every essay question has a clear reasoning process that it is asking and students know um, that they are um, supposed to be moving towards a reasoning process. Next slide. Part of the redesign was crafting this course and exam description. So every subject has a, a, a online um, large amount of information that covers the course. There are separate ones for world history, European history, and US history. They have detailed descriptions of learning objectives and accessible content. This means that AP high school teachers know what is and what is not fair game for the exam. And that frees up time for them to teach as college instructors do more so, going into depth on particular topics that illustrate a larger concept without worrying about every term or fact in the textbook will show up on the exam. Teachers have more flexibility to make choices about what particular uh, facts or content they can use to illustrate these bigger topics. Um, particularly, it's really rich for regional history. They can look at more in their own backyard. Um, and this has freed up, um, uh, in American history, it freed us up a bit from sort of the tyranny of the East Coast, right? And so people in other parts of the country that often are given short shrift in textbooks can actually you know, use examples from their areas more often. Next slide. This is an example of a redesigned short answer question from the US history exam. It gives students two interpretations of the impact of the American Revolution for women. And then it asks them to do three tasks. So again, this is not an essay. This is more like one of those shooting drills in basketball. So in A, it asks them um, to compare which is one of our historical thinking skills, and B and C ask for concrete examples so that their students do need to know um, some bedrock of facts and things. But again, the students have great flexibility to draw on what their teacher taught them uh, to give uh, an, a concrete example to illustrate this point. So for example, students could draw on political history, economic history, social history, and get uh, credit for this question. Um, so ultimately, teachers know they have to cover bedrock subjects like, say, the American Revolution. But within that, there's not a giant list of facts that students must know. This gives more flexibility for teachers to cover the subject. It, it also kind of um, 
encourages students to think about history as not just a list of things that happen in facts, but interpretations and the stories that we tell about the past. Next slide. The centerpiece of the history AP exam is the document-based question, which we call the DBQ. This is an example from the 2019 World History Exam. Students are given a question, and it's always key to a thinking skill. This one looks like continuity and change over time, and they're given seven documents. In this DBQ, students need to draw on the documents in order to answer the question. Emerging students might be able to earn a few points with a description of some events and maybe some contextualization. More sophisticated students will show a wider array of skills, um, sourcing primary documents, for example, saying how the point of view of the author impacts the way it connects to the argument or the purpose of the document, and build a more sophisticated kind of argument. Next slide. This is a very brief overview of the rubric that we use for the document-based question. Um, and this is one of the changes. Essays used to be scored holistically uh, with criteria to be sure, but it was given just you know one score from a range of zero to nine overall. And here, this is more specific that readers are looking for specific scores. It may be an emerging student, but they still came up with a thesis or a middling student, you can see use some evidence, some contextualization, uh, could actually craft an argument, but never really had the skill to like boil it down into a one or two sentence thesis. So we can actually, you know, break down exactly what we're looking for and exactly how students are doing it. Teachers can also use the rubric, AP teachers, while they're teaching their courses to uh, encourage students to think about what's in their essay and if they got a low score, what, what skill do they need to work on in order to earn more points. Next slide. Because of the pandemic in the spring, um, College Board made the decision to cancel the in-person exam. Um, however, they heard strongly from students that students wanted the opportunity to earn credit for the hard work they'd done all year. Um, I have a freshman in college right now. So last year she was a senior in high school and um, I really identified with these students since I had one in my house um, that who I, I was a little bit worried about society collapsing or, you know, like big terrible things like that. But she was focused on, are we having prom? I'm still going to college. What am I registering for? And so it was really good for me to keep grounded to see like, yeah, they want to keep moving. We can't just like, you know, cancel the world. So AP pivoted and we whipped together um, very conscientiously a lot of changes. So we shifted to an online test uh, because of safety concerns and school shutdowns. And we had a much shorter time frame. Uh, we kept the DBQ, so that was the one question they asked. This is the, the big higher order uh, question instead of a lot of smaller questions. So we, we gave students a chance to show us the best that they could do, and some of them really wrote amazing exams. So I'm just so glad that we, we did this, that we gave them that opportunity to earn credit, and so many of them were able to enter college with, with these credits. We also had online scoring, which was an exciting challenge for those of us who score. Next slide. Like a good AP essay, I have a short conclusion using the reasoning process of continuity and change. So uh, some of the continuities we've had over time with both the redesign and the pivot to the uh, 2020 exigency is that we continue to have partnerships with higher ed professionals. This is a core value to make sure that the exam is in line with what uh, is going on in the college history surveys. We continue to have college level expectations uh, to focus on student success. And this includes the important equity issues that Dan and Norm brought up. And we have a scoring event with intensive preparation. Some changes though, particularly from the redesign is the shift to the historical thinking skills, uh, the ability for teachers to have flexibility to cover different content in class, student flexibility on the exam to come up with different examples, and this shift from holistic scoring to analytic scoring and I added a little something for College Board to think about. And uh, with that, I'm done sharing my slides and I'm happy to introduce Ed Ayers, who is the Boatwright Professor of History, the Humanities at the University of Richmond, where he is President Emeritus. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Michelle. That was really interesting and useful and I uh, appreciate uh, having a chance to participate on this. Uh, yeah, before I was president, uh, I, was, I taught the second half of the US survey for about a quarter of a century at the University of Virginia, several thousand students. So I wanna be sure to play on that to win any credibility eroded by having been an administrator. Uh, and so that I, and, and there I discovered many students who had either taken AP, but had to take my class because they were in the education school. That was kind of created anxiety for me. Uh, and, but also try to compete and, and create a class that was good enough that people would give away AP credit to take my class. So I've known a complex relationship with the AP of uh, rivalry and, and, uh, and fear. Uh, and then when I became Dean of Arts and Sciences there and had to think about enrollments, I saw advanced placement in a new way. Then I became president and had to think about uh, attracting and admitting students and AP in another way. And then came back out the other side, as Michelle says, I'm emeritus now, so I'm no longer uh, a president and I'm a historian again. And I found after doing all that, and serving as president of the OAH and chairing a big committee for the AHA on recognition of digital scholarship and hiring tenure and promotion. Uh, what did I care about? I cared about this. I cared about teaching history to as many students as we can in as good a way as we can. And uh, I don't think there's anything more important that we're doing. H having seen all those other elements of higher education, I decided what is the one thing that we have in common? We're all trying to share this passion, this perhaps irrational passion we have for the past uh, with people who can be persuaded to learn about it, what I know about it. So I've been really impressed. I, I have to admit, I've learned a lot about the work of the College Board um, in preparing for this over the last decade. And I think all the revisions that Michelle just described for us point in the right direction toward exploration and inquiry towards showing students how to confront primary sources and waste secondary sources. And what I'd like to suggest in my few moments is that I think we should follow the example of that trajectory to develop our teaching of history more broadly in many history courses, because we have lots of new possibilities in these before us. One thing we might think about is flipping a familiar acronym, as well as DBQs, document-based questions. We might think about question-based documents, QBD, uh, because questions are really what drive our discipline. If you look at the tuning projects, AHA guidelines, uh, they actually talk about inquiry and questions are the animating spirit of our discipline. They don't even mention the phrase primary documents, which is interesting to think about what it is that um, they've identified as what's critical to what we're doing. In fact, secondary sources begin with questions not documents. Documents take on their meaning only in response to the questions we ask of them. We know this, and it's interesting to try to convey this to people who, for whom this is an alien way of thinking. So the other thing we have to think about is ways to acknowledge the overabundance of sources with which we and our students are confronted. How do we frame questions and come up with strategies to make sense of too much evidence? What if every day was instead of seven DBQ documents, 300, and they're coming to you unchallenged uh, from lots of different places? How do you make sense of that? So that's what we're working on now. We're trying to figure out how do we use the classes, the opportunities we have to help give students the skills they need to navigate through life. That's the way we use history in the future is navigating among too much history. And it's, history can actually be a model to answer other kinds of curiosity and need. So almost nothing in life outside the classroom comes with the evidence carefully defined, excerpted, and framed, with the range of answers carefully delimited. Unfortunately, I wish it did, but instead, there's all these strange angles, surprises that are coming to you. And as we've seen increasingly in the age of social media, all kinds of evidence is coming to you with all kinds of dubious claims that it's making, but it's still coming to you and it's still framed in terms of history. So, you know, when I was teaching several hundred people at a time uh, in US history, I wanted them to confront history raw in some ways. It turns out you can have people read a single issue of a magazine 
and find all kinds of interesting questions in that, or even a single issue of a newspaper or a collection of photographs or sheet music or cartoons or television news, all the things that are in profusion online. So Megan, could you please show the page for my presentation? So what we're starting to do now uh, is something called New American History. And the idea is, is that history is coming to us in such profusion that we need new ways to make sense of it. But it's also the case that we've never had more history around us to find ways uh, to uh, explore. So on New American History, uh, we have uh, interactive mapping. Uh, you see a sample of it there. We have a podcast. We have a PBS series. And we have something called Bunk. And Thank you, Megan, for that. If you could click on the Explore button in the upper right-hand corner, and then scroll down to where it says Bunk History. Thank you, you read my mind. So Bunk History, first of all, it's named after the Henry Ford quote that history is more or less bunk. The only history that matters to Tinker's Dam is the history we make today. This is daily curated representations of the past in all media. So you see today we have the New Yorker, the bitter Southerner, not even past, uh, Aeon, Commentary, the Washington Post, made by history. So there are blogs. This is produced by journalists, which is made by professional students. You see things all the way from relatively sick, silly, apparently, the secrets of deviled eggs, even though I can imagine situations in which it's important that deviled eggs be done right. But you can also see things that you know that are students be likely to kick up the tack. That's right, the one that says taverns. So go ahead, Megan, you, since you wanted to look at that, just go ahead and, and click on it. Uh, and when you do, it will take you to an excerpt of that article and it will show you all kinds of connections. If you go over to where it says view connections, Megan, and what that will do, it will show you different things that are related to taverns and American civil society. You can see the different tags are social hierarchies, elitism, social class. So choose any one of those that you like, Megan. We have 72 articles on elitism. So you can see that it allows students to follow their curiosity and you click on any one of those and it creates a whole nother world of, of connections. And so they're all tagged so they connect with each other in multiple dimensions. They can all be searched and saved and shared, and students can create and annotate their own collections. So the assignment could be, hey, everybody's talking about elitism of the East Coast liberals. I think, Michelle, I don't know if that was your comment earlier. Uh, so that's much in the discourse today. Let's look and see how people have dealt with elitism in American history before this. Find the three best articles that you think are interesting. Send a, it'll generate a URL, send it to me. We'll look at it in class and you'll explain to me why you think, or to your colleagues, why you thought this was the best article about elitism. So it involves all those skills that Michelle was laying out of contextualization, of comparing and contrasting and, and, and thinking about the ways that things connect. But this is meant to reflect and so there's 6,000 articles now, and it's, it's really today. So if you're walking to class, you're trying to think about how do we connect with what kids are reading about or hearing about now, we can show you the article that was generated yesterday, okay? That would do this. So this is what I call ambient history uh, or history in the wild. Uh, it's materials sold to our students as something other than history. So students can see how questions and answers connect and conflict and contradict one another and how they use evidence. So the same skills that Michelle just described, you can show them how they can use this in their daily life today, right? And they can practice those skills uh, with these kinds of sources. Now, we've seen, you saw things from a wide array of political, uh, if you go ahead and click on the bunk symbol in the upper left-hand corner, uh, yes, Michelle, you can see the things that we just talked about, everything from what you might think of commentary as conservative uh, to, to the Post and the New Yorker of liberal. And so that's something that students get to think about. Why are people writing this story? What do they hope to pursue? They're, they're not doing it for tenure. They're not doing it for a test. Why are they creating this? And how are they using history to frame these kinds of issues? So we could imagine in a, an AP class even, a capstone project. 
that would crystallize what students have learned in the rest of the course to show what they can do on their own. Now, I, I will leave it to experts in assessment to think about how such projects could be evaluated, especially in the numbers. Maybe Michelle can tell us and how you would go about evaluating such a thing. But the recent history of the College Board and their work in history courses gives me confidence that, that we can figure it out. In some ways, this would take advantage of the best of history day, right? But it would bring it to the level of students and the, the texture of their classes. And it would show that anybody can do this. You don't have to be an honor student to be able to figure out how do you curate history coming to you in different media. And so we, New American History uses audio and video and visual and written words so the students have different kinds of strengths and interests. And I was glad to see that the example of the DBQ that Michelle showed used a map. So we have dynamic maps that also have every single part of the country represented all the time. And my saying on that is I want every seventh grade girl in America to be able to see herself in American history. So we've made these big capacious dynamic maps that work much like bunk, they only answer a question if you ask it. You have to come in and explore it. So the new AP buys us freedom from rote testing and instruction. And I think we could use that freedom and that example to explore history in new ways. Advanced placement and gateway courses, we have a chance to work with the Gardner Institute and the wonderful work they're doing and making sure that those of us who are teaching students who probably didn't take AP, but are still before us in introductory classes, also have a chance to see history in exciting ways and engaging ways and to benefit from the clarity that uh, the College Board has brought to the thinking about AP. So those classes can be gateways to the world in which students will live their lives after they leave our classes. So broadening and deepening, deepening the possibilities of inquiry to include a broader range of people and subjects may be the most important step toward equity and inclusion that we can take. If people can see themselves in the past, they can see themselves in the present and in the future. Most of our students won't become history majors, but they will all need to learn how to navigate a complicated world in which history confronts them every day and in constantly changing ways. So glad to have a chance to, to talk with you today to build on the great clarity and insight and research that the College Board has done to, to show that there's lots of different ways that we might think about uh, enlivening our teaching of history. So with that, I'll open us up to the question and answer period. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move now to the questions and answers. If you have, we've had a few questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You may continue to submit those. Uh, we had some come in through the registration forms and panelists have some questions for each other as well. So we'll try to get to um, as much of that as we can. And I will do my best with a lot of smaller windows. Um, so um, there are some questions sort of that we, I think we can maybe deal with fairly quickly. Um, how do AP courses get added to College Board's slate of offerings? And um, I think there was, we should be able to have an answer to that here on the panel. So Norm, would that be you? I, I can certainly make a stab at it. Uh, because when AP was created, of course, it mirrored the curriculum. So the, when you, you get a course added, you add a course because the curriculum has changed. So uh, one of the recent courses that has been added is the computer science course. And obviously they didn't have computer science in the 1950s. They didn't create an exam for it, but, but now they've added that. And that's, that's sort of the ongoing conversation as the academy moves. AP moves because AP continues to mirror what's going on in basically the freshman year. And another question, uh, what do we see as the role of higher education faculty members in instructing AP teachers? I think that might be a professional development preparation question. Michelle, is that one or Dan, uh, Norm? 
<laughs> I could, wants to take that one. Yeah, sure. I could I could speak. I don't know a, a great deal about all of the pathways, but I, I do know that there are institutes that um, high school teachers can go to that College Board um, organizes and often gets college professor, professionals to um, give you know, workshops or seminars. Uh, for example, last summer I went to Rice University as one of those things and spoke about the progressive era to, uh, I, I don't know, 50 or 100 high school teachers um, who, you know, hadn't, you know, heard the, the latest ways of framing or thinking about it for a while. So there, there are a number of pathways. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure someone else could detail them better than I could. I, I can add to that, because yeah, obviously there there are the things you're talking about. There are also all sorts of resources. That's that's where the AP Daily lectures come in. But uh, people teaching AP courses have an enormous access to resources, as do their students. So lots of things that we as as college faculty would be quite jealous of, <laughs> because they, well, it's not just, you know, go teach this. It is, we will give you all the backup that you need to go teach this. And so you start with, right, with a curriculum that is developed by professionals, and then you have the workshops, and then you have the online tools. So it's re really very impressive. And say, the AP Daily, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just, I worked with the Gilder Lehrman Institute a lot, and that's where in US history, uh, AP teachers come in. And what's exciting there is how much they teach each other. I know I'll go to dinner or lunch and just sit there, be quiet and take notes because to, to see all the energy and good ideas they're swapping around. Do we have a, on our, our chat feature, do we have a link to AP Daily and instructions for how uh, colleagues can uh, sample some of the resources there. I think we have had that. We've had a lot of other things in the chat as well. And we will um, follow up the webinar to registrants. We will send an email that will include a lot of those links as well. So don't feel like you have to cut and paste from the chat uh, if, or you'll lose it. We will set, make sure that you have access to those uh, resources and links after the fact as well. Uh, but yes, is the I, answer. I've, I would like to jump in with one more thing, uh, which is a big part of my life. I'm not sure why I didn't think of it earlier, but the we have this reading event, which this year was online, but in previous years has always been live. And for US history, that brings about 1500 people, uh, college, a mix of college um, higher ed people and high school teachers. And there's a lot of professional development. Some of it's informal, like Ed was saying, a lot of them just chatting at lunch or chatting at their table, swap tips. And, and I learned a lot about teaching when I was a reader going to these, but there's also more formal things. We always, um, at the US history, we always have an OEH night where we bring in an OEH speaker you know, free for all the readers to see. And we have a best practices teaching night where we have a, um, whole set of workshops um, by the readers to give teaching tips and practices. And sometimes we have a uh, state of the field night where we'll get some of our higher ed people just to talk about, hey, what's new in civil rights history or what's going on with environmental history? Um, just to kind of go over what are some of the key books and, and things about that. And those are, so there's a lot of professional development um, and it's different at each um, reading event, but it's, it's happening. And a sort of related question about the support that the College Board can offer teachers who have virtual or online students. I definitely think the website is very rich. Um, I don't have a login for it myself because I'm not an AP teacher, but um, if you do, there's a ton there. The AP Daily, I think is literally daily. Um, and it has videos that can be student facing as well as sort of providing additional insights for faculty members interested in the latest research on a given topic. So that's some of it. Um, also just having the curriculum and the way the curriculum is supported is a, a, a resource that can be used online as well. So um, those are- And if two you want Ed Ayers to teach your class, you can go get his video from AP Daily. And try, you can just try to see if you can follow that act. Um, that's the risk of that kind of thing, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so it's like being on on camera with small children or animals, right? Actors aren't supposed to try that. Try that. <laughs> um, so another question we have from registration: Would you consider, and I think you here would be the College Board, consider incorporating chapters on the long-term history of the connections and relationship in between East Asia and the Americas? Um, so I don't. 
our world history pre-recorded video, the person is not on the, uh, so I don't know if any of you guys can address that. It's an idea for the college board. Anyway. I think that's the sort of thing that, that goes into the hopper because the these ideas are constantly percolating. And as M Michelle and Ed have both pointed out, we keep changing what we do uh, because the academy keeps saying, well, we need to do something else. And so I think, yes, they would consider that, just as the, the conversation has to go forward. You are talking about a, a, a bureaucratic system, after all, you're writing tests that are you know, we've got a couple of years lag time on this. <laughs> I, I, I work with the College Board and work with the History Social Science courses. And so to, to follow up on Norm's point, we absolutely um, try to be driven by what higher ed uh, community deems as important for these for these intro level courses. And so we are constantly surveying and receiving feedback and then relooking at the courses. And so absolutely, um, that's something that if it seems like an appropriate trend in survey level courses, we absolutely would look at updating our content to include uh, content like that. And we are right now in the midst of of looking at the the bigger landscape of higher ed and what what do our survey courses need as we're going forward and then um we'll bring higher ed in to make sure that they're informing any changes that happen to the courses thank you and this is kelly stromberg with the college board who was had her video off but has been here to help um okay we have two questions which i'm going to pair and try to at least start an answer but i will then hand it over to others um one is from a high school Teacher, why are so many college history professors opposed to AP classes? And then from a college professor, AP has a very bad reputation in my department, um, the, not because of the perceived quality of the education, but because um, they are thinking that the AP is the reason their enrollments are going down. And some of this has to do with internal, um, most of it is internal to an institution that administrators and uh, faculty who oversee the curriculum might be seen as pitting each other, uh, pitting themselves against each other, especially in terms of budgets and resources and things like that related to enrollment. Another issue is the rigor, which I think has been addressed in this forum. And generally, I think AP has a very strong reputation for rigor. Um, student performance in the AP takes, you know, is at different levels. And I think another thing that's happened is uh, state legislatures have often mandated that co uh, public colleges and universities in their states accept for credit an AP score of something, and that is seen as take rightfully as taking away control over um, the curriculum from college and university faculty. So there are different interests being represented here, and they're they're often not in as much conflict as it seems like they would be from um, kind of a, a, a local perspective. Uh, it can be hard though to watch your decline, uh, enrollments decline. Uh, one of the things that I do with the AHA is an annual survey of undergraduate enrollment and history courses. I just wrapped up this, this year's analysis and they're pretty stable, but with a lot of variation across different institution types. And I do see this in some of the optional comments from the enrollment survey. Oh, it's the AP credits that are doing it. Oh, it's the dual enrollment credits that's doing it. Uh, what I also see though is um, some of the respondents admitting, you know, we could be doing more or our recruiting, it hasn't really had much of a refresh recently or our faculty aren't that involved in recruitment or, hey, we tried this new recruitment strategy and it's really working. So I think some of it is, um, again, hard to see when you're, at a single institution, but when you take a broader view, you can you can still see a lot of places where college faculty have a lot of agency that might help to turn around declining enrollments. Uh, some of the things I see are um, a less reliance on the introductory courses for recruitment. I know that the College Board has done a lot of research and found that students who take an AP course and exam in a given subject are, are more likely to take more of that subject when they get to a college campus. So uh, definitely that weighs in my analysis, but I also, again, see a lot of places where uh, individual departments have turned things around by taking direct action themselves. 
and looking beyond the survey to do recruitment. Uh, one of the things that the AP should help to enable is relationships with uh, local high schools where students have demonstrated an interest in history by taking the AP history course. So um, those places where the, the college department has reached out to the high schools and even gone over and talked to the students about majoring in history or about taking history when they get to the college, that, that kind of thing makes a difference. It also takes a lot of time and planning. And I think that's one of the things that's difficult um, to see how you can get it done, especially if your department is already kind of strapped for resources. So um, I encourage college-based faculty, university faculty to do that kind of outreach and to look broadly for places uh, where they can intervene and help support student interest in history, whether it be in the major or in minors or just taking more history classes. So um, that's what I've seen if other panelists want to weigh in. Let me, yeah, I'll, I'll weigh in on that. Uh, Julia has sent me her surveys because I've been looking at the use of general education, uh, of history in general education. And you do see that pattern that people are blaming AP and concurrent enrollment. And in some states, especially concurrent enrollment is eating into the enrollments. There's no doubt about that. Um, AP, not so much simply because a AP is, is not, you know, if you kind of figure out per capita is, is like a COVID rate, right? How many APs per 100,000? <laughs> it's, it's much lower than concurrent enrollment. But one of the things that we also see that is hurting the enrollment is that the uh, institutions are changing their curricula and the history departments are losing their their share of the curricula. We used to just assume that we had a fixed place in that economy and you can't assume that that's there anymore. Uh, so why why are college professors worried? Well because they are seeing that if, if they're paid by the head but the for the te people that they teach they are seeing decline in demand. So that's not about the AP test that's about my employment. That, that's why you might be upset about AP. On the other hand, there's a huge opportunity there. As Julia says, if, if you start reaching out to the students that are taking the AP and saying, you liked history there, you'll like history even more when you get to our place, it, it can help with your enrollments. And, and within a fairly stable overall enrollment uh, picture nationally, there are huge variations, as I said, there are some places, um, I know a couple places that implemented kind of wide ranging recruitment and retention plans and sort of marketing of the major that had over three or four years, 50% increase in enrollments. And then obviously there are structural constraints in, in institutions that will pre prevent those kinds of fantastic results, but um, it's, it's still worth coming up with a plan with your colleagues and, and doing that work. Um, it can only benefit. I haven't heard of any recruitment uh, plans backfiring. So <laughs> some of them are not as successful, but none of them have been counterproductive. Um, okay. I just so, wanted to jump in with one suggestion. And that's, I just wanted to say, I, I think these are wise words from Julia and Norm and um, definitely things to think about. Um, one of the things I learned from a trick from another subject was um, from the chief reader of the Spanish exam, who is, they're also experiencing the same kind of concerns, declining enrollment and AP credits and things like that. Um, he, his department started um, working with admissions to send a letter to students who had taken one or more AP courses uh, in Spanish and actually tailored it to the student to say, hey, you have this many credits. If you take this many more credits, you could easily get a minor in Spanish and history. We we're thinking of implementing that here. And he actually did, you know, kept track of the numbers and their minors enrollment went up, which, you know, then had a ripple effect on the majors too. So that's just one possible kind of specific recruiting thing you can do instead of just thinking of the AP students as lost, um, you, could, you could draw them back in. Definitely. And they, they're they've already demonstrated an interest in the in the discipline, so uh, they're they're more likely to be open to that than sort of a, a more generic recruiting pool. So um, another question we have here: uh, How do panelists view the relationship or the the cohabitation is the word used here uh, between AP and dual enrollment in the future going forward? Do they serve the same student? Uh, we try to push dual enrollment as an equity issue to provide a chance for students to earn college credit who might not otherwise consider college as an option. And this uh, participant would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, 
I'm talking too much, Julia. This may be one we can drag Kelly into. Um, but the AP's or the College Board's own research suggests that the student who's going to succeed best in college has uh, one AP and one concurrent enrollment course. So they're not necessarily in competition with one another. This is all about how do you have an experience of rigor before you come to college. Kelly, is that right? <clears throat> right, that the what's in the best interest of students is for them to have the most, um, and, and I think Ed um, alluded to this earlier, the most rigorous experience they can before they hit the college campus. Um, and that looks like different things in different pl places. Um, one of the things you alluded to, Norm, was the fact that, that we have a standardized assessment, um, a criterion referenced standardized assessment for AP, which, which at least makes some of those things a known quantity. But, the, um, but, but again, what's in the best interest of students is that they have an experience that gives them a glimpse into what they'll be expecting in, when they hit uh, a college campus so that they understand uh, of what will be demanded of them and they can be successful once they get there. And there are many of these concurrent or dual enrollment programs that offer that. And that is uh, what AP offers as well. So that we are all serving the same purpose, which is trying to get these students transitioned from their secondary experience to a successful transition into higher ed. Thank you. And uh, another question we have live, can the panelists address the relationship between content and historical thinking? Uh, it goes on, hang on one second. We have reached a point where our society can't even agree on the existence of evidence and everyone thinks that any interpretation of a primary source or a secondary source is valid. How can we counteract this as history educators? I'm happy to, to start with this since I spend a lot of time scoring the exams and thinking about how to score the exams. Um, the, the short answer, well, first of all, there's many components to the exam in a normal year. So there, there are still multiple choice questions that are, are structured a bit differently, not just content, but students do have to know some content to answer them correctly. And with the um, short answer example that I showed you that had two interpretations of the American Revolution that, you know, when historian says the American Revolution was, you know, just maintain the status quo for women and the other said no no it opened up whole new opportunities and advancement for women um, and students had to to earn all three points in in the task b they had to provide evidence to support one of those views and in task c they had to provide evidence to support another one of the views so they had to provide correct evidence to um to, to match the skill and in the essay um, most a great deal of the points in the essay are about uh, not just providing evidence, but employing the evidence in a skill. So you can't have a skill without evidence. You can't get a, a point for, for having an argument if the argument has no evidence. And part of the rubric, and I didn't show you the whole rubric because it's text heavy and everything, but it, it says a historically defensible claim. So it, it has to be historically accurate in some way. Um, when we were de designing the rubric, I think I was part of in the room where it happened where I said, can we have something in there where it says it has to make some damn sense, you know? And so we translated that into historically defensible claim. So that that is part of the language there. Um, so th there is still a great deal of, ev of emphasis on, on having accurate um, evidence. There's just more flexibility for teachers to provide different kinds of, of evidence possibilities. I'd say that, that uh, New American History in some ways is a machine to generate answers to that question. How would you evaluate an argument that doesn't come with somebody with a PhD and a title with a colon in it, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, but just an argument that people are making off of some, you know, a tweet or something, right? And I think in the same, like, as we do with everything else, there's no way to get better at that other than to practice it. But having a machine basically that it, that gives you the comparison doesn't tell you what to think about it, but to show you how these things are making the similar claims is a way to sort of strengthen your muscles of thinking about all that. So, you know, I think one of the things that it would show is that, oh, I can see how they're using evidence. This is really stacked. I'm going to be skeptical of that in the future. So that's, we just decided to go into the face of that and to recognize that even when historians are in the public realm, uh, they're probably not making historic, historiographically framed questions or arguments. They are arguing in a current conversation. So 
uh, that's what we were trying to do is to acknowledge that in some ways history keeps leaking out of the, of the containers <laughs> that we have in it. And um, I can't finish the metaphor, but you get the idea of what it is that we're trying to do. I'll stop there. Julia, it, it also strikes me that uh, a lot of this comes back to one of the comments I'm, I'm very grateful that Michelle raised. A simple question, a simple question, an urgent question about language. Um, I, Michelle, you made the comment about simply uh, writing a note uh, saying descriptive rather than analytical. And uh, all of this should be a reminder to us whether in, we're involved with AP, dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, introductory classes, advanced classes. Uh, students need to understand what we mean by our instructions. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this comes from a colleague in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, David Pace at Indiana University, who gave a workshop several years ago at the AHA about his uh, decoding strategy in the field of history. The need for us to, as, especially as we introduce a topic to our students, no matter what kind of background they come from, to decode the language we use to describe our historical thinking processes. And David's example to all of us was, what if you walk into a classroom and it's the end of class and you tell students, oh, you know what, Friday, I want you to read pages 50 to 94 in Foner's book. And then uh, we're gonna come in Friday and just talk about uh, some of the key issues that Eric Foner raises. I'll see you then. And, uh, and uh, David reminds all of us, you got to think about how students hear the word read. How do students read uh, 44 pages in a study by Eric Foner? They read like this. Every word, every line, every point is of equal importance. They make no distinction. Uh, and they close the book, walk in, and rarely have something interesting to say in an analytical discussion. And David Pace asks us, how do you read 44 pages in, uh, in a, a book by Foner? He says, yeah, you're going through, not like this, you're moving through in all kinds of complicated ways. You're, you're going through it, uh, uh, hitting different pages, looking for major themes, uh, looking, starting at the beginning, going to a conclusion, but then looking at major themes, how they're worked out, what are the key uh, pieces of evidence behind that? Uh, what are the questions that the evidence raises? Um, and you're just moving back and forth among different parts of a, of a work. Your students don't know that. Our work is not only to have well-chosen documents, well-chosen articles, uh, well-chosen uh, 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 examples of uh, historical analysis, but to come back to that elementary language that we use, read, discuss, analyze. Somebody in a chemistry class might have one way of approaching those three verbs. A psychology class, how do we approach it in a history class? What's the key to our discipline and the way we approach these basic skills in doing our work and the work we hope to share with our students. Um, no matter how closely tied we are to AP exams, I think there's a, a great value in just listening to the discussion, especially that, that's come from Michelle, about the attentiveness to understandable, accessible language for those just entering a discipline rather than those who have advanced training in it. Uh, I, I think it's a good general reminder about all of this work. Reminds me of my favorite lines in Saturday Night Live that, that ties into Michelle's talk that she gave. The progressive era, neither progressive nor an era. <laughs> Um, I, we have a, a, a few more questions, including ones that I had, but we don't have, we're running low on time. Uh, one of the ideas that came up from a participant who teaches at a community college, uh, he has experience with students having 
students students in in other majors or programs, even certificate programs, having a keen interest in the history of those careers that they're interested in. How can the history, the history community, and especially higher education faculty with the support of the college board, maybe try to help address some of those um, that potential for as an as an entry point for students into the history discipline. I think I'm going to make yeah Norm start that one. Okay. Uh, well, I love the idea, and I think that that's one of those places where the interface be between AP and history might might be activated because you've got students who might already be interested in history but most people are not going to major <clears throat> so they're they're going off to business or they're going off to education or they're something else and they probably would be delighted if you would say for those headed in this direction let's have a course that helps you understand the the world the historical origins of the world you're headed into uh, we taught a course for a while on the financial history of the United States, which is essentially the students would do a project on the history of a major corporation. And it just was eye opening. I, I actually suspect it cost the business college some majors. Uh, but it, it, that, that kind of uh, response to their interest might be very profitable, especially in a two year college setting where that might be one of those electives that helps you as you were kind of preparing to transition into a major. And, and Julia, one other brief recommendation here for both instructors and for students is to listen to what employers are saying. Who do they want? What kind of skills are they looking for? And there's a very convenient source for this. Uh, I'll, I'll try to add something to our chat <laughs> if, I, if I'm able to. But for those listening, it, it, you might want to look at a, a, the documents or the surveys done by a group called the AACNU, the Association of American Colleges and Universities. They have a series of surveys that they've done over the years with employers. And the key is to outline the kinds of knowledge and skills that employers are employers themselves say they are looking for. It's important not only for our students to see that, it's equally important for instructors to see that, to understand what kind of messages we're giving in a class, in an office visit, in an email with a student about what, what academic and practical benefits emerge out of historical study. The kind, of, uh, uh, the kind of discussion about historical skills that we've been focused on for so long in our, in our, uh, in our discipline, especially since 2008, 2009. And to understand the richness of historical, uh, historical study in practical applications in the job market. AACNU employer surveys and uh, uh, Visitors to that site can get into, with no charge, get in to see the results of these. And once again, the language that's used, the language that we should be incorporating into our discussions with students. And what those surveys show is that what employers want are people who can express themselves in written and spoken language and to do exactly the kinds of skills that Michelle laid out on those. I think it's perhaps easier to explain people today when we're so used to the fact that we're living through enormous flux and change, what could be more useful than a discipline that teaches you how to live with flux and change and to make sense of it? So I think you're, you're right, Dan, if translated into language that it's not about us, but about their needs and purposes, uh, I think that we're teaching what's shown over time the most valuable single skill. Thank you. Um, we're going to take just another two or three minutes. One of the questions was how your interaction and involvement with AP courses and exams has helped you in your own teaching and maybe especially this year, I guess, would be the how to narrow in on that. I 
think even our retired panelists are still teaching because that's that's their vision of retirement. Um, I'm in a, a bit different circumstance the past uh, year and a half. Um, the students I'm I'm focusing my intro course on are working adults who have not earned a um, who have not been in school for a while. They've been in jobs. Uh, they've been raising families, and they're trying to earn an associate's degree leading to a bachelor's degree that would give them the opportunity in their position to advance within a company. Um, these are older men and women, non-traditional students who don't have the opportunity to do AP. Um, the project is, is called competence-based. Uh, general education. And um, I, I've been removed for a while in, in my emeritus status, working with students who are just coming out of high school, who have had that kind of experience. Norm, um, has your recent teaching kept you in touch with those, well, those 18 to 21 year olds, you know, a more traditional uh, academic audience? No, I'm working with people who have enough Latin that so they, they've had to been had to be in the system for a while. I think Michelle has an answer to this. Yeah. Right, I'm still in the trenches. So yes, yeah, so I'm teaching uh, three courses right now. And one of them is the survey with uh, 120 people uh, asynchronous online, which I've never done before. So it's been quite an adventure for me. Um, and one thing this experience in uh, scoring and grading AV questions gave me the confidence to do was to um, not not just use a test book and a test bank, um, but no no judgment to people who are doing that. We're all doing what we can, but um, using uh, primary sources and a secondary reader and assigning two homework assignments a week, um, which I grade um, because I I'm armed with my rubrics, so I can grade them very quickly and not give many comments on them and just kind of give general comments afterwards. And for the test, I did not give a multiple choice test. I gave a an essay test with with writing two essays. Um, uh, part of that, I will be honest, was, uh, it was hard to translate my multiple choice into the Canvas platform. So <laughs> part of it was <laughs> part of it was self-serving. Um, I initially hoped to do uh, a little bit of both, but no, two essays we had, um, and it, it actually worked fairly well. Um, so I could I, I could like sort of work the students up. We did a uh, discussion forum the week before the exam where I, I would put them into groups and gave them a potential essay question and told them to discuss potential frameworks, uh, ways of answering it, using some of those historical reasoning processes and thinking skills. And they sort of thought about different documents that would be relevant and how they would use them. And then when they did that, I would give them another question so that they had this kind of build up on online. So in a 100 per, 120 person class, they were in groups and they could discuss how to potentially, you know, we could kind of workshop it out amongst themselves. And then they took the test on their own and I, you know, melted them down like butter scoring them with my rubrics so it, it it helped me transition to an asynchronous online class thank you and if you have we'll be sending out some resources to people who registered whether or not they were able to join us today so if if the panelists have additional things that come to mind and they'd like to share them with either uh, again people who were here today please let us know michelle if you have your um your butter melting tips um, I know every semester, every term, people need help with that. So, um, you know, the, the scale is an issue, right? And that's one of the really great things I think about uh, what the College Board is able to do is the scale of it. Uh, it's it's not an it's a it's a rigorous and well supported process that is not limited in the way that so, some of the more artisanal kind of teaching and learning methods are. And uh, I would love to be able to share that with more people to help them. Because a lot of people, even if they are they were trained in an artisanal model are nevertheless being asked to teach um, at scale. And that, that can be a hard transition. So whatever whatever resources you guys have that can help. I know the, the, web, the web resources that we've looked at in the presentations are a great place to start. But even some of this more um, nuts and bolts stuff is helpful to people. So I, I look forward to seeing some of those. Uh, thank you all very much. I think we are, well, we're past time, but only by a couple minutes. Um, the recording to, for this 
webinar will be on the AHA YouTube channel. It usually takes about 10 days to get it on there. And I encourage you guys if, to share it with your colleagues if you were able to join us today. And um, if you know people who weren't able to join us today to, to let them know about it. The pre-recorded video will be linked in some way so that people can see them both together. Um, as well as, as I said, an email will go out that will include resources. So thank you very much. And uh, I think, you know, the more of us who are doing this work, the better it is for all of us. I think it's really important to keep that optimistic look um, on things and to understand the opportunities that having all these resources and people devoted to this project of helping expand high quality history education can bring to people. So um, again, more is more. And thank you for all your, your work and for your presentations today.